Um, well, um, hi everyone again, and welcome to this talk, which is about one uh, vulnerability that we have found in Microsoft Windows that allows an attacker to inject um, keystrokes, uh, impersonating um, previously paired uh, legitimate keyboard. Um, but uh, before uh, going further in the presentation, let us uh, try to get your attention and uh, put the car before the horses and show you this um, very, very accelerated version of our uh, demo video. And uh, please pay attention because it's gonna, get, it's gonna be quick. This is the scenario, this is the legitimate keyboard going disconnected, then this is the attacker launching the attack, and then uh, as soon as the attacker launches the attack, the fake device is going to be present in the, in the space, and then the Windows box connects to the fake device and the keys get, in, get injected. <laughs> um, we hope that everything is clear for everyone, but if it is not, uh, we have the rest of the talk to try to explain it to you. So uh, please uh, be with us and, and, and hopefully we, we explain it right, right to you. Hello everyone. Now I try to explain the, the video again, but this time uh, in, uh, slowly. So the first thing to know is, uh, who are the participants in the video? And we have a Windows PC, a Bluetooth Low Energy Keyboard, and the attacker that are using a Linux PC with a special dongle. Before the video starts, a Bluetooth Low Energy Keyboard and the Windows PC uh, perform the, the Bluetooth pairing uh, in order to, to establish an encrypted channel. And all the data that are, they are communicating are encrypted. Um, so every time that the Bluetooth Low Energy Keyboard uh, reconnects with the Windows PC, um, the encryption channel, uh, the encrypted channel uh, is established, and all the data will be uh, encrypted. As the Bluetooth Low Energy Keyboard is a Bluetooth, is a low energy device, uh, after a few period of, after a little period of time, um, the keyboard disconnects in order to save some energy. And it's in this moment when an attacker could impersonate the, the Bluetooth Low Energy keyboard and send some keystrokes, uh, some not encrypted keystrokes. But how is this possible? Because uh, we said before that the Windows PC and the keyboard um, establish an encryption channel every time that it reconnects. Um, we send not encrypted data and are, and are accepted by the window, by the windows. So that's what this talk is about. And let's start from the beginning. Uh, here's Jose and I'm Fernando. Uh, we are security researchers. We like to play with security and with communication protocols. We also climb and ride motorbikes, as you could see in the photo in our spare time. Uh, we come from Spain and work in LIAC. And what we saw in this talk, uh, we start with a brief description of Bluetooth Low Energy concepts. Uh, some concepts only in order to, to understand better the, the vulnerability. Now, uh, then we detail how this attack is possible and what parts of the specs of the Bluetooth specs and the Windows allow this attack. Then we show you two approaches of how we try to exploit this vulnerability. And the first one doesn't work and the second approach is the current exploit. Uh, we continue with a proof of concepts showing all the hardware and software that we need to perform the attack and uh, some demos and conclude the the, this talk showing some data about the vulnerability disclosure, some related publications and reference uh, that help us to find and exploit this vulnerability. Um, as you will see during the talk, the, the, the attack is extremely simple, but we, we think that um, it's important to introduce some Bluetooth uh, low energy concepts that, uh, helps, that help to understand the attack, especially if you are not familiar with the Bluetooth uh, protocols. And the first one of these concepts is this concept of pairing. When two, when two Bluetooth devices want to 
uh, protect their communications. They uh, must finish this pairing procedure, as they call it. Uh, the objective of this procedure is to establish a, a key, which is called the long-term key, that will be used every... The, by the way, this is only performed the first time they connect, and then they, sh they keep this long-term long key, and they use it every time they, watch, they want to connect each other again to derive a session key that is the key that is going to protect this particular connection. We are not talking about the different pairing schemes or association models because they are not relevant for the attack. We, we just left them here uh, for, your, for your reference. But we do, talk, we do want to talk about another concept about Bluetooth low energy um, protocols is that, um, that the, uh, the layers, the, 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 the layer set is split in two parts. The host part, which uh, holds the upper part of the, of the, of the protocol, uh, which contains the l 2 cap protocol, also the ATT protocol that uh, manages and shows and uh, interacts with the attributes of every device. This upper part talks with, uh, with the application layer, which is above it. In our case, the application layer would be the HID, the human interface device, which is, is because we are, we are uh, attacking a keyboard. Uh, and the, the lower part of the, of the protocol layers are called the controller one. And you will find several different uh, configurations of that. For example, in the keyboard case, you will find that the host and the controller are both implemented in the keyboard. But for example, if, you, if we are talking about a Windows box or, or a Linux box, the host is, is implemented in the operating system. For example, if you have Linux, the host is the blue set uh, implementation of that. And the controller is implemented in the firmware of the device that you're using, either an embedded device or chipset or, or an external dongle. Uh, this firmware implements a controller. The communication between these two parts uh, is very uh, straightly forward called host to controller interface, HCI. And um, um, the host sends information to the controller by uh, one thing that is called commands and the controller sends to the host uh, events. Uh, it's just a, uh, a question of names. But the, one of the important things or one of the things that we want to emphasize here is that encryption happens at the link layer. So the host part doesn't do anything about encryption except maybe, no, not maybe, except just managing the state of the encryption and calculating the long-term key, and that's all. And wh whenever the link layer needs the long-term key to calculate the session key, then the host part provides this long-term key. So this is, this is a very important concept, and you will see why during our presentation, because it's very uh, directly related with the attack. And we have still one uh, more concept to, to introduce to you before explaining the attack, which is, um, let's imagine this is a scenario where we have the master device, and we're using here the uh, Bluetooth 5.2 specification uh, terminology. Uh, in our case, in our scenario, the master device is the Windows uh, machine. And we have the slave device in our scenario. The slave device is, the, is a Bluetooth low energy keyboard. And we have the situation here. We, we, the start point is the situation where these two devices have previously uh, paired, completed the pairing procedure that I talked before. So they both have the long-term key associated with this connection. And they, they want to reconnect. They want to create a new connection. And, and we are going to see right now what happens here and how, how does it work. So the master, uh, the host part of the master, uh, instructs the link layer to create a connection. It just uh, provokes in the link layer that the link layer starts, starts listening for, uh, for the slave to appear in the air. And more particularly to advertising messages from the slave. Uh, the slave is sleeping right now because he, he went to sleep uh, to save energy and he restarts whenever the user presses a key and then it provokes that the host informs or instructs the link layer uh, to start advertising himself with this uh, command set advertising enable and then eventually this uh, one of these advertising messages uh, gets uh, gets to the link layer of the master and then the, the master answers back with a connect indication uh, link layer message to the link layer of the slave. Please uh, see that this, everything happens at the link layer. So the host is only participating in the controlling part of the state of the protocol. Uh, at, at this point of, uh, of the protocol, the connection has been created and, the li and both link layer inform their, their correspondent uh, host part that the connection has been created. The connection is created, but it's not encrypted, not encrypted yet. This is what is going to happen now. 
the master that holds the long-term key knows that this connection should be encrypted. So it, as soon as the connection is created, it should, and it usually does, it uh, instructs the link layer to start encryption. Then, at this point, the link layer calculates its part, the master part, of two random values. The SKD, which is the session key diversifier, and an initialization vector. This, two, this part is sent to the, to the slave, to the link layer of the slave, with the encryption request PDU, and the, the slave calculates its part of, this, of these values, and send back it with the encryption response PDU to the, to the link layer of the master. Uh, if, you, if you think there is one thing left, is that the slave does not have the long-term key. The master, the link layer of the master, do have the long-term key because it has been provided with the, with the enable encryption command. But the slave doesn't have that, so it has to ask for it. And if the slave has, the, if the host of the slave has the long-term key, which is the case, uh, it will answer back with the long-term key. At this point, both devices can calculate the session key diversifier because they have the both parts and the initialization vector, which. Uh, I, I just remind you that there are, these are random, random numbers, okay? And they both can calculate the session key that is going to, to protect this particular uh, connection. The session key is calculated by encrypting the session key diversifier using uh, as encryption key the long-term key and as initialization vector the calculated initialization vector. So at this point, both have calculated the session key. And the only thing that left to, uh, to finish the, encryption, the start encryption procedure, let's say that, is to, uh, le let's, uh, let's say, agree on the point in time where the, where the encryption starts. And this is made uh, with this kind of handshake, we'd say, we, you say that, uh, uh, that starts with the start encryption request command, send not encrypted by the link layer, and then, sorry, by the link layer of the slave, then the link layer of the master answers back with a standard encryption response, and this message is already be encrypted with the session key. Okay, so if the slave receives this message and it is able to uh, to decrypt it, uh, then it's so to speak kind of authentication of this master, and it does exactly the same thing. It encrypts this encryption response command with this this this, this just calculated session key, and so both are let's say, authenticated and the uh, connection is encrypted, is protected. At this point, it's very important, and this is, this is very, very important for the attack that we're explaining here, is that at this point, the link layer informs the host that the encryption has started. And it's at this point that the encryption has started and not before. Uh, and you, you will understand just in, in a couple of slides that why I'm emphasizing this. Uh, every next or every subsequent uh, PDUs will be encrypted from now on for this for this particular connection. So we've seen uh, these uh, three or four concepts of about Bluetooth, and now uh, we are going to explain how it is possible to inject keys with with all this context that we have explained. So, what make what makes the attack possible? In, in fact, there are two things that make the attack possible. The first thing is one thing that it, we we don't. Um, we don't call it a vulnerability. It's something that is present, it's explicitly defined in the specification, in the Bluetooth standard. And it's the fact that when the slave, div sorry, when the slave device receives the encryption request PDU, it is explicitly allowed to send any, remain any remaining PDUs that he has to send to the master and he has in his queues in a non-encrypted, in a not encrypted way. It's explicitly allowed. And I can show you the, the, the part of the standard where this is, uh, where this is uh, written, written down. This is, from my, our point of view, this is not a vulnerability. It's just uh, something that is there to allow the slave to empty its queues before continuing to send in encrypted, encrypted uh, uh, PDUs or encrypted data. But the second one, the second thing that allows the attack, this is the vulnerability. Sorry, uh, before that. Um, what, what, uh, what I wanted to say in this slide is that um, this, this, uh, this characteristic that I, I just uh, explained creates a window uh, of opportunity for, the, for an attacker trying to impersonate this slave device uh, where he can send uh, data through the connection, through the Bluetooth connection, and the, mas the master, oh, sorry, the, the link layer of the master will accept this PDU, this PDUs, will accept this data. And it is the responsibility of the upper part of the protocol to 
consider that this data is uh, valid or not. And this is precisely this, the second thing that allows the attack, which is the vulnerability. Uh, it seems that Microsoft Windows does not wait for this event, which is the encryption change event, does not wait for this event to consider that any PDU coming from the slave, uh, it's legit. So it seems that uh, it considers that encryption has started as soon as, as the host part of the master orders the encryption to start, which is not the case. You have to wait until, until receiving this encryption change event. So th this allows us to, to try to impersonate the slave up to this point and send all these unencrypted PDUs without actually knowing the long-term key which will be needed to, to really uh, complete this procedure of start encryption. And this is, this is the thing that allowed the attack. This is the two things that allowed the attack. Okay, now we will explain the two approaches that, that we follow in order to, to try to exploit this vulnerability. As I said before, the first one um, is working at the host level. Uh, work with the host level has a very big problem. That is that we don't decide when the message are really sent. We only tell the controller part to send some data to some high level data. But we don't decide where exactly this data uh, is sent. We are trying to um, put some PDUs between the encryption request and the encryption response, and we couldn't decide where um, the PDUs we try to send are uh, exactly uh, put. And to implement this, this, this approach, we use an HCI adapter, a common HCI adapter, with the only particularity that uh, it allows to change the BD address in order to impersonate the, the Bluetooth keyboard and use the Mirage framework. Uh, the Mirage framework is, uh, among other thing, allows, among other things, uh, to hook some parts of the communication and change the normal flow of this communication. And we use, we use it to intercept the connection event and after this event, we start to send keystrokes and doesn't send any anything else. Um, as I said, that it's um, we doesn't decide where the the message are effectively sent. Uh, we need some tries to succeed and put some of these keystrokes between the encryption request and encryption response. And now we will show you some capture in the air. We just sniffle to to capture this this uh, message. That is a Bluetooth low energy sniffer. In the left side, you could see the um, the direction of the communication, master to slave or slave to master. And as, as, as I said, the connect request is sent by the master and received by the slave. And ju just after that, we start sending keystrokes. But you can see that there are some link layer messages that we have not controlled and are sent. And then the normal flow of the communication starts, and encryption request is received by the by the fake slave, by the slave. And the slave is trying to send more keystrokes. Then the controller part of the fake slave responds automatically uh, with an encryption response and asks for the launder key. As we haven't got the launder key, the key missing is, is sent back to the controller and it is translated to, to link layer reject, reject indication. Once master receives this message, it closes the, the connection immediately because uh, the, the encryption channel could not be established. And our fake slave continue trying to, to send some, some key strokes. Uh, the, most, the, the most important thing in these uh, uh, slides is to understand that we are trying to send a lot of keystrokes between encryption request and encryption response, and as we have a good control about when the the each level data is sent, we can decide that these keystrokes hit between encryption request and encryption response. There are only one uh, notification message that hit there, and it means that 
there are only one keystroke that are effectively uh, injected and processed by by the master. So we realize that if we want to to exploit this vulnerability, we should go down um, and develop something that works in the controller level. And, and, and this is this is what we did, and this is the actually uh, implementation of the attack. We uh, implemented the attack at the link layer level, at the controller level. Uh, in order to do that, we used this. Uh, let me say that's fantastic framework, which is called the Cephar. Uh, it's a completely uh, from top to bottom open source implementation of the Bluetooth low energy protocol stack. So uh, this you can compile that and create a firmware that can run in, in one of these dongles, which is a Nordic uh, RF 50, 52H40 um, that has no very 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 few costs. It's very small costs, um, and we, what we when we implement this in the, at the link layer, what we can do is to control where these keystrokes that we want to send can fall into the protocol state. So we can control that. All, we can uh, allow the, uh, the protocol at the link layer to reach this point, and then we can freeze the protocol uh, and send all the keystrokes that we want to send. This. There is no tomorrow, and then just wait for the. Um, for the master to terminate the connection. The master will terminate the connection because he's actually waiting for the encryption response command, or PDU, sorry. And this, this w will never arrive because we are not going to send it. So a timeout will expire here, and this, after this timeout expires, he, the master sends the terminate indication PDU, just dropping the connection. But at this point, all the keystrokes that we have sent have been already uh, accepted by the master. And we can see that in uh, air capture, like uh, I'm going to show, to show you right now. Uh, in this air capture, you can see that the connect request comes, and then all the subsequent normal link layer messages that uh, let's say, advance in the, uh, in the um, state of the connection, which objective is uh, eventually to encrypt it. But as soon as we received the uh, encryption request PDU, what we do is to freeze the link layer at, in the fake slave. And then instead of continuing the normal functioning of the link layer, that will be to send encryption response, to ask for the long-term the long key, to our host part, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We just don't do that, and instead of that, we send all the keystrokes that that we want to send, as you can see here, and we send all of them. And at, uh, when eventually, what we we send all of them, and then we just stop sending things. We just wait for the master to drop the connection. But all these keys have been already been accepted. Now we have an exploit that allows us to inject some keystrokes uh, into, into the, the master. Uh, but we want to try to increment the number of keystrokes that we can uh, inject in one connection. So we try to send a lot of keystrokes uh, with no waiting time. But this causes a problem because at the beginning of the communication, if we try to send a lot of keystrokes, some of these messages are lost or aren't processed by the master. So we implement this uh, exponential decrement of waiting time, time that starts waiting four seconds. That is a lot of time, but it works. Uh, and then every time that uh, a keystroke is sent, divide this waiting time by two until it reaches 20 milliseconds. This uh, implementation allows us to, to inject more than 13,000 keystrokes in one connection of 30 seconds. And we have a demo uh, at the end of the talk. We implement other, other upgrades to, in order to make easy the, the, the configuration of the dongle. Uh, we implement these HCI vendor commands to program the dongle with some special, some characteristics of each device and what case strokes w we want to send in, in every connection without having to recompile Cephal every time that we want to change something. Uh, we include uh, uh, an HCI command to, to program the handle, the report size, and, and and the operation type, and to clear the list of the keystrokes that will be sent and the add some keystroke 
to add a keystroke to, to be sent when the connection is established. We also implement some uh, special act actions. Um, for, uh, for example, this is the, the action to sleep. We can tell the dongle to sleep some milliseconds between two keystrokes are sent. Uh, in this case, it's sleeping um, 500 milliseconds. And we implement uh, another option that was the room forever that is, uh, we think that is only for a testing purpose to, and it uh, allow us to repeat the list of keystrokes in a loop until the connection is, is uh, closed by, by the master. So now uh, let's see what we need to perform the attack. And we need uh, the Nordic uh, dongle that costs about $30. It's a Bluetooth low energy dongle. Uh, we also need the, our modified uh, Cephal firmware that you can find it in our GitHub. I don't know, it, is it published now? Yeah. <laughs> you can find it in our GitHub. And with these two things, you can program the dongle, but it's uh, quite hard because you need to use the HCI tool and put the bytes the manually, and we develop some auxiliary tools that help us to, to program the dongle in a more user-friendly way. Okay, before we can uh, perform the attack, we need to know some characteristics about the Bluetooth Low Energy keyboard that we want to impersonate. And basically, we need to know how this uh, specific keyboard send uh, the report da data to, to the master and the MAC address of the real uh, keyboard that we want to impersonate. The first data that we need could be extracted using a replica and analyzing uh, the communications. It's uh, very easy because uh, if you press a key on, on a real, on a legitimate keyboard, you could see on Wireshark that it's sending a report uh, using a specific handle. In this case, it's the 13 with a specific structure that has uh, 11 bytes. And, and the operation type or opcode that is identification and usually is identification. And to get the MAC address, we could listen in the air at the real um, keyboard. Um, and we separate two modes. The first mode was when the keyboard isn't paired uh, yet. And before, when the keyboard enters in the pairing mode, it starts sending uh, advertising uh, indications like this that has the appearance that uh, is the, a keyboard and the company, in this case, we use a Microsoft keyboard. And it this message includes the, the VD address or the MAC address. During this, uh, uh, this mode, it also sends a scan response that includes the full device name and the advertising address. But it's not realistic that the attacker uh, were always when the pairing is performing. So there are another way to get the MAC address and it's when uh, the keyboard is reconnecting to the Windows PC. And it's this kind of message that are advertising the identification that includes the BD address of the keyboard and the MAC address of the, of the PC. Once we have all this information, we could write the configuration file that we need to, to run the attack. And it includes the report handle, the, the report size, and the operation type that we collect before analyzing a replica. And the last attribute on, on the configuration file was the text script that are the characters that we want to send to the, to the victim. Uh, we could include in this characters, uh, some special characters like left windows or enter using braces, and we could send two keys uh, pressed together like left windows plus R that are in the first example. Uh, in this case, for example, is to open the, the room dialog of windows, the shortcut to open the room dialog. And we also use 
the special actions using the common name, common name and arguments. Uh, this example of te uh, text script uh, opens uh, the run dialog of, of Windows, write PowerShell, uh, press enter, and then uh, sleep for five, uh, 500 milliseconds, and then open a calc that is a common uh, proof of concept. Um, once we have this, uh, this configuration file written, we could call the KB injection.py that only needs the HCI where the dongle is, is, uh, is, is identified. The BD address the, of the keyboard that we want to impersonate and the configuration file. We add two more options that is the room forever that as I told before, uh, send in a loop the keystrokes that we want to, to inject and the NOAC that prints common HCI commands instead of, of, of running it directly. And we are approaching the end of our talk. This is uh, demo time again, but this time uh, at, uh, let's say, the real time uh, pace. Um, this is the, the actual uh, demo of the attack. This is the scenario that you can, you can find here, the victim, the legitimate keyboard, and the attacker uh, Linux PC that is uh, connected to, uh, to this dongle here. And what we can see here is that the legitimate user is just typing its work uh, onto the, uh, to the Windows machine, uh, just typing his regular work, uh, as we can see right now. And um, eventually what is going to happen is that this uh, regular user uh, will, will stop, will stop uh, typing because he wants a coffee or whatever. And at this, at, at this point in time, this inactivity period is going to start. Uh, now we, we are going to see that while this inactivity period is, is, is counting, the attacker launches his, his attack. Uh, and it, it launches using all the techniques that we have explained to you. Uh, the important thing here is that the attacker does, doesn't have to synchronize himself to the point in time where the legitimate keyboard is going to be disconnected. He doesn't need to do that because uh, as soon as he launches the attack, the fake device will start advertising. And these advertising messages will be just ignored by the Windows machine because the Windows machine is just still connected to the legitimate keyboard. So the attacker can launch the attack and just wait for the legitimate keyboard to disconnect, which is what we are doing right now. We, fast, we are fast forwarding uh, time just to reach the point where the legitimate keyboard is going to be disconnected to save energy, as we have explained before, uh, which in this case for this keyboard was about 10 minutes. And as we can see right now, the, the keyboard is going to be disconnected. We can see here in the control panel uh, window. And at this point, the Windows machine acting as a master will try to create a new connection. We'll try to reconnect or create a new connection to be activated as soon as the keyboard appears again. But the keyboard that is going to appear is not the legitimate one, it's our keyboard that we are trying to, that we are impersonating the legitimate keyboard. And all these key strokes have been injected, as you can see. Uh, in this case, we've launched a PowerShell and we've uh, just uh, written a, a downloader that downloads this malware that just for the proof of concept just shows this uh, image. And that's all. Thanks a lot, by the way. Um, we have this uh, other uh, demo uh, to show you that uh, this attack not only works for uh, for keyboards, it, all, it also works for uh, uh, other HID devices like a mouse. Uh, in this case, we've, uh, we've just recorded a proof of concept. Uh, the, the principles of the attack are exactly the same. Uh, the only thing that changes is that the format of the PDUs that we're sending contain a different data because the HID format of the mouse is different from the keyboard. But other than that, the principles are exactly the same. As you can see, the keyboard gets, gets disconnected and then, uh, and then the fake, the fake uh, mouse will, will uh, the, the Windows box will connect with, to the fake mouse just as it did for, for the fake uh, keyboard and we program some movements and, and some uh, clicks of the of the mouse just to show this square in on the on the paint uh, program of windows
And we have left uh, another demo for you, is the one that shows how many keystrokes we are able to, to produce in only one connection, in only one shot. And this is the demo. I'm going to let it run at real time because uh, even if it, it lasts for a few seconds, uh, we wanted you to, to, to see uh, the real time of the attack. So at this point in time, um, the attacker has launched the attack and as you can see, keystrokes start, start coming. And they keep coming, they keep coming up to the point that the, uh, uh, the, the master, which in this case is the Windows uh, machine, will disconnect, the, uh, will drop the connection using the terminate indication command. Uh, as you can see, this is real time. Uh, this is uh, all the keys that we can send to the master in only one connection. Uh, in this case, we are sending it to the, just to the notepad, just to, just, just to illustrate that. This is just a, pr a proof of, con of concept. But just, just to count how many keystrokes we, we are able to inject. And at the end, as you can see here, more than 13,000 keys have been injected. And we think that this is more than enough to write some downloader or even some PowerShell malware or whatever. So the impact is, uh, is that way. So. And finally, we did the vulnerability disclosure with Microsoft they, in February this year. They immediately uh, acknowledged the, the bug and uh, the bug is already solved. Uh, the patch has been issued. So please patch your systems. And if you want to play with it, uh, we've, we've, we have made this publication. We have, I mean, you, ha you have this talk uh, if you want to, to review the attack or to understand the attack or to play with it. And if this talk is not uh, enough because our English is not very good looking, uh, then we have tried to, to write down all the things here in our post in our blog. And uh, we also have uh, all the tools and our modified firmware in our GitHub page. And we left here some reference for you, the reference for the tools that we have used for making the captures, the Cephar project, uh, and other things, and also the, re the references to the specifications and some previous work that we have read. They are not directly related with our work because uh, they're quite different, but we have read them, so we left here uh, for, uh, also for your reference. And that will be all from our part, and we thank you very much for your attention. If you have any question, we will be around, and we'll have more happy to you. Thanks a lot.